Welcome back to the Timco Retail Manager course. This course focuses on real world application development. Basically, this is a job simulator. Each video will be a task that you might be asked to undertake in an actual job. In this lesson, we're going to address some outstanding warnings and informational messages that Visual Studio has been bugging us about for a while now. It's always a good practice to clean up all of these warnings, errors, and informational messages so that you don't miss many more important messages in the future. Now, right now, these messages aren't the end of the world. It still works, but they can start to lull us into that sense of we can ignore those. And then when one pops up that's important, that's when we run into trouble. So we're going to clean these up today. Now, if you are a Patreon subscriber at the $5 per month level or higher, head on over to get today's source code so you can kind of follow along and make sure that, that your version of the product matches what I have and see if you've missed anything. Okay. Now, just, just so you know, those are not going to be archived forever. So if you're watching this video two years later, they may not be there. Um, just so you know. All right. Now let's jump on over to Visual Studio. And bring it up here. And if we do a build right now, so let's do a rebuild. Rebuild clears everything out, starts over, builds the whole thing up, and makes sure that uh, we have everything kind of at a good state. But if we notice here in the error list, we have 12 warnings and zero messages. So let's address these as they come. The first one here is the field login.show authentication error is assigned, a assigned, but its value is never used. This is a pretty common one. It's a, actually a really important warning message. It's almost to the level it should be an error. You can change these if you want. You can go in and look for the CS0414 code. You can elevate that to an error if you want in your options. But this is important for, for a reason that may not be obvious at first. Now I double click on it, it goes right to it. So this, this right here has been assigned a value. It's assigned a value of false, but then we never actually use this, this uh, variable in any way. So right down here, we have show authentication errors false. We have show authentication errors true, but we never actually use that anywhere. Notice that there's no uh, message here anywhere that, that's being displayed. So the reason why this is important is because if you create a variable, you probably had a reason to create it. We don't just randomly create variables. So if a variable is being assigned to, but never used, it's an indication that you may have missed something in your logic. You may have uh, kind of skipped over a step or, or just not finished what you started. This can happen in a number of different ways. For example, if you get interrupted at work and you come back and think that you're picking up where you left off, maybe you skipped from step seven to step nine. Or in this case, we reworked this page where this used to be a full standalone page, the login page, but now notice it no longer has that, um, that page directive. Instead, this is now an element that goes on, I believe the nav menu, uh, where we have a, a login page. Oops, not nav menu, the main layout. There we go. So at the top, we'll have the authorized and not authorized right there is the, the login page. So that's where that goes. Instead of being a full page, it's just a little, a little bit, which means that we've got a variable here where it says show authentication error that we are using. We're saying it's true, but we're not actually making use of it. We're changing the true. And the idea behind that is that we then show this text, but we never show that text anywhere. So we've got a problem here where we need to figure out where to put this error message. And I'm not sure what the, the right answer is here. Um, so I, I think we need to kind of think through how do we make this login page better? So just by tracking down this one issue, this one warning, I have found kind of a bug in my system. 
I think I'm going to do, I'm going to say if, I'll say if show authentication error, then we'll have a div, and inside that div, we'll have, um, well, let's have a class here equals, I believe it's, uh, I want to have, yep, text dash danger. It's nice to have IntelliSense there. Um, so text dash danger, that's going to turn it red. And I'm going to put the authentication error text right in here um, just as a string. Okay, so this will create a div. It'll be that means it's going to be below the form, which I, which should expand it out. I'm actually going to run this and make sure it works the way I'm hoping it does. This is a pretty quick fix, but I think it's going to get us at least to a place where it's working the way that um, is more what we intended. So let's log out here, and let's just say that I put in like that. Nope. There's an error when trying to log in. Okay, so it put it afterwards, which isn't ideal. I'd like to have it below instead. Let's find out why this happened. I'm gonna maximize this. I'm gonna hit F12. If you don't know about the, the developer tools by hitting F12, get to know your developer tools. That will significantly improve your life. Now, I'm gonna put these in the bottom. They have a little more space here. And I'm going to select this element right here. And now it's, it looks like it's after the form. So why is this not wrapping? Okay, I see the issue here. It's this right here, the flex. So because this is marked as a flex, everything inside here is going to be a, a flex box or a flex box element. And it's going to put it all in one line here, which is why I'm not getting a second line below this. I could probably put this below the form though. So let's just see if we can't um, kind of play around this a little bit. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy this element. I'm gonna copy the, um, copy the element. Then I'm gonna edit the form class. I'm gonna say edit is HTML. And then down here, at the, right before the end form, I'm going to paste in that element. And there we go. Um, it pushed it up and it made it kind of messy in the spacing. But I think that actually works. The, um, the thing that to be careful of, and this is something we cover in my uh, foundation web development course, is that your HTML really needs to be about structure. It's not about layout. It's about structure. There's a difference there. So how is this going to work with a screen reader? How is this going to work with something like that? I don't think it's going to work well. So while we're visually putting it in the right spot, I'm, I'm not happy with, with where it's going. I think what I need to do instead is I need to edit as HTML again. And I'm going to cut this out. I'm going to say div and class equals form dash row. So this is a little small. I'm gonna paste this in and I say uh, slash div. This is going to give it at least, we'll have different rows in the form and an error message is really part of a form. Um, so I think I like that a little better. Um, let's get rid of, of this other one that's that shouldn't be here. Um, delete element, there we go. And we'll close this out. And it, it crunches it up and makes this, I, I'm guessing, if we go back here and look, I'm guessing that this has a fixed height to it. Um, so this row right here probably has a, a fixed height. So if we scroll down here under what's applied, um, yes, I think this is it right in here that the height is 3.5 rem, which if you're not familiar with what RAM is, again, we covered that in the foundation web development course. Um, foundation web development. There we go. Sorry, a little crunch together there. But um, what this is, is going to base the, uh, this height is going to be a uh, three point or three and a half times larger 
than the font size for the website. So as the font size gets bigger at the main root of the website, this will get bigger as well. But if we take this off, it does give us more space. If we change this to be, let's do 4.5. Yeah, see that now that gives us a better space, but the portal over here is um, not matching up. So if we go back to 3.5, you'll notice that um, if we zoom in here, see that the line underneath portal, how it's a darker color versus the lighter color, and that matches up exactly with the line for our, our light gray area, which is our, our header for our page. If we make this header 4.5, we have to make the other 4.5 as well, which we can do. I mean, we can, we can definitely do that. Um, you wouldn't do that by messing with the portal.styles.css probably. What you would, actually you would because it's, um, that's our custom style sheet. So we can definitely do that. Or I believe it is, it's line 16. Um, let's pop open Visual Studio and go back to the Solution Explorer, go to our www root CSS. And no, it's, it's actually the kind of crunched together version. Uh, because this is this is ours. We have an app.css. So the style.css is something that they they kind of put together themselves and kind of mash different things together, which makes it a little harder to backtrack to the actual spot. But if we looked for um, this, which I'm not I'm not sure if it's actually gonna be in CSS or not. Let's find out. Now copy it. And then we can come over here to CSS. I'm guessing it's in Bootstrap, which is a minified version. Of course it is. Um, so if we do Control F and do a, a find for that in the current project, it's not going to be found. Um, we'll have to override that setting, essentially. So that's pretty common, what you need to do anyway. But it's nice we can just modify it right in the CSS if it's your custom style. But since it's going to be the style from, I believe, Bootstrap or maybe their theme, um, but we want to modify ourselves to change it or not. It's up to us if we want to, to see that change happen. Okay, so I'm going to leave it without changing it. We're going to leave it like like this. So remember, if you close this right now, you're going to lose all your changes. So I'm okay with that, but just note that. Otherwise you forget and you have like four changes in there. That's a problem. So the, this right here, instead of putting this here, I'm going to cut this out. I should cut this whole thing out. I'm going to put it at right after the last div here. And we're going to cut this out and put a div with a class equals, um, I think it's form dot row. Yes form.row. And then inside there, we'll put our, um, our new div with a text danger. Go ahead and tab that out. That's the correct spot. And that should solve that error. Okay, and that error went away. So now we have nine warnings instead of 12 we had a four. I think that took care of a couple different warnings because we're also using now the authentication error text as well. So let's uh, look at the next one. Okay, the next one says the database error page extensions dot use database error page in iApplication Builder is obsolete. Double click on that, it goes right down here and it says this is obsolete. Uh, bummer. So what we do about that? Well, it gave us a link. If we if you look at the error list, it says, um, and of course it's not there right now, you gotta scroll down to the right one. Um, it says go to aka.ms slash database developer page exception filter. So if we bring up our browser, we paste in that URL. Now I could have just typed that out, um, but if you select this and say copy and then paste it into a notepad, you can pull out just the text you want. So this is saying, hey, um, they're deprecating this particular way of declaring this. In fact, it's uh, deprecated in .NET 5 with plans to remove it in .NET 6. So we want our code to be 
always moving forward, always ready to move to the next version. So we don't want to have roadblocks in place. Well, this is a breaking change that would be a roadblock. So let's fix this. The really cool thing is in here, let me zoom in. You can see it a little better. Um, in here, it says recommended action. Remove use of this line right here. So that's step one. Well, I can do that. Gone. Now that's step one. Step two is to make sure that you have these two lines here. So app.useDeveloper exception page. Yep, got that. And app.use migrations endpoint. Nope, don't have that. So let's copy that line and put it in. And then third, we're gonna add the database developer page exception filter to your services, which is this right here. Okay. And if we come up to our services, we can figure services. At the very top, we can just add that one line. Now, what is this doing? Well, they used to have a database exception page and then they had a developer exception page. And now they kind of combined those two and made it more extensible. And so this right here adds some things to dependency injection. And then down here, we are going to use the same page for both. We also need to have a migrations endpoint. This is where um, doing things in open source is really helpful because we have this nice, hey, we're obsoleting this. This is what's coming. It's a breaking change. And here's what you do to fix it. Great documentation here. If you had any problems, you can reference this particular um, post, this particular issue, and say, hey, based upon that issue, I have this problem and so on. And it does talk a little bit more about the affected APIs. The discussion is right here. So you click on that. We can go through the discussion. So there's more information about that um, if we wanted to discuss this particular change. So really cool stuff there. But that solves that problem. Now our error list has eight warnings. Right to the top. All right, this, uh, actually let's, let's stick with where we were. Um, desktop UI depends on caliber and micro greater than or equal to 4.0.158-RC. But Caliburn Micro 4.0.158-RC was not found. An approximate best match of 4.0.173 was resolved. So in our WPF project, and let's um, pull that up now. If we go to our, um, notice the hard to see, there's a little red, or I'm sorry, a little yellow triangle here saying there's a problem on our dependencies. If we go to manage NuGet packages and look, we're using version 4.0.173 for Caliber and Micro. And yeah, it says we, we're using 4.0.158-RC, what we're asking for. Well, if you go to desktop UI, right click and say edit project file, look down where Caliber and Micro is referenced and there's the version number. So the solution here, match it up, 173. Cool, good, we're good to go. All right, and with that, we close this out. Notice that little yellow triangle went away because what we had done originally was we had used a release candidate version of Caliber and Micro that worked with .NET 5. Well, they've actually published that version and just so you know, they're continuing to publish new versions of Caliber and Micro. It has come back from the brink of extinction, the brink of relegation to a no longer updated package. And now there's a whole new team working on making sure that Caliber and Micro stays current and has new things invested in it because it is a great framework. So um, it is still being worked on, which is awesome. But with that, we now have that error fixed. We're now down to four warnings. Okay, so let's tackle this one. The package HT dot Microsoft dot net dot HTTP 2.0.20710 was restored using 
.NET Framework version 4.6.1. That's kind of odd because we have nothing to do with .NET Framework in this project or any of the projects. And it says, hey, you're using that instead of some of the targets .NET 5, all right? Now, if we look down here, this one actually kind of gives us a hint because not everything is going to be real clear cut. But remember that packages use other packages and to have other dependencies behind the scenes. Swashbuckle.core. Well, I don't believe we need swashbuckle.core. And in fact, if we go up here, the API, notice the little yellow triangle again. If we open this up under packages, we can see that swashbuckle.core is the one that's yelling at us. What are we gonna do? I'm going to right click, say manage NuGet packages. I'm gonna scroll down and find the swashbuckle.core. This is the one that's causing the problems. So I'm gonna uninstall because I believe that we don't need the swashbuckle.core because of the fact that we moved to .NET 5, which has swashbuckle built into some other things like the, um, the ASP.core dot swagger. So let's leave that be. Notice that my yellow exclamation point went away on the API and the error list is now empty. So let's rebuild the solution. Once it's done, go back to the error list. We have four warnings still. All right. So let's look at the warnings. So this warning right here says that because this call is not awaited, execution of the current method continues before the call is completed. Add an await operator. Well, yes, we are saying try close async, but that really, it seems like should be called with an await. All right, so let's go ahead and await that call. All right, now, because this, this call is not awaited, load roles, it's not awaited, then it continues on. Select a user, then notify a property change. Yes, for sure, we want to await the loading of roles before we then notify that we are making a change. Now, right here, it says, hey, you got a problem. That's because we need to mark this as asynchronous because we're awaiting. The problem here is that we're actually in a property, which is an issue. Um, we don't want to mess with this. And actually what this really highlights for us is the fact that we're probably doing too much in this setter. This is probably doing too much. It should probably be a method, not necessarily a setter, but we can figure out how to do that better later. But for now we can do, and this is, so you need to be very careful of, and I would only do it here. So I want you to hear me in this. Don't just abuse this, but we can say dot result. Actually result is the property. I think what I want here is wait. There we go. So this is not great. Okay. This is not the, a great solution, but what it is, is we're saying basically take this asynchronous call and wait for it, make it synchronous. So we're going to block the UI thread until this is done, which effectively turns it back synchronous with some caveats. There's some dangers here about deadlocking. Um, there's some dangers here about with, um, what thread it returns on. If you're not careful, if you got some, um, configure, I think it's configure await or false in certain areas that can cause it to be in the wrong thread. It's a little tricky. So it's not what I'd prefer to do, but it does address the problem since we have it in a setter of a property. Again, I like to pull it out of here and turn it into a method. And in fact, I'm going to do is I'm going to say turn, um, pull this out into a method slash event. 
so that uh, we pull this out, call it correctly asynchronously, don't swallow the error if there is one, all those good things we wanna handle properly, but for right now, this does solve the problem. All right, over here, we have one more try close async, which again, we can await because we have an async method that's being used. Now we have one last warning. It says it's no longer necessary to use the Microsoft.net.sdk.windows.desktop SDK. Double click on this does not take you to the right spot, but if we right click on desktop UI and go to edit project file, very top, this used to be the SDK we use, but now they have collapsed it back down into Microsoft.net.sdk. So we don't need to say dot Windows desktop anymore. It's just a kind of a cleanup thing. Um, so, and that should get rid of that once you rebuild. So we'll rebuild. And now we have zero warnings. Cool. But we do have eight messages. Let's address those as well. We want to get this as clean as possible. If a message is here and you say, I don't care about this, then set it up to not be a message anymore. Because otherwise, you'll see stuff in here and go, ah, got it all. But you may miss one that's scrolled off the page. So make field read only. All right. So these fields here, not all of them are private read only. No. Nope. Let's address that. There's no reason for them not to be private read only. And in fact, we had some of them already private read only. That's definitely something to address. And in fact, if you look up here, um, that was a sales view model. Um, we should look at other ones as well. The login view model, um, those are not marked as read only. All right, so since we, we haven't done this consistently, we wanna make sure we update these to be consistent. Notice that not everything here was indicated as, as being an issue because the way messages work, they don't always go into closed files. So you may not see everything, but let's, let's build the solution now. I didn't rebuild, but I, I built. Um, go to the error list, and then we have five messages here still. New expression, can be simplified. Well, this is just cleanup stuff, but private binding list cart item display model cart equals new, and all this, we can just say equals new. And now it doesn't scroll the page, which is kind of nice. And again, we can go like this. That solves that one. And you don't have to do this. If you say, you know what, I don't like this format, then take this off as a message. IDE 0090, take that off. Okay, but it's reducing a lot of our code here. So we're not scrolling side to side as much. I like it. Okay, so I'm gonna close every window here. Save them all. Rebuild everything. Check the error list. No errors, no warnings, no messages. Make sure you check to see if there's a number in here other than zero because you may have just unchecked the box. Notice that messages is no longer has a box around it. That's because I'm no longer showing those messages. Look at it again to show it. So you may be actually hiding some warnings or hiding some messages and just showing errors. Make sure you're showing all three and make sure you address all three. If again, if there's a message showing up that you say, ah, I don't want that, then get rid of it. Now I'll probably address how to get rid of those in a future video um, with editor config and other configuration tools. You can tweak what type of settings you want for what shows, what doesn't, and how it shows. But um, in the meantime, make sure these are all zeros, okay? Clean that out. Make sure that whenever you build your product, you're looking at this and making sure that there's nothing that pops up in here. What'll happen is, You'll work on new, let's see if we can actually trip this again. Uh, home controller, no, that's probably not gonna trip it. Um, 
These are all marked correctly, private read only. So if, if we open it always up, oh, we actually have four messages now. So home control out longer. This can be removed because we never use it. So why do we even have it if we never use it? Get rid of it. No reason to ask for something you're not using. You can always bring it back later. All right, new expression can be simplified. So there's another one of those. And you may say, hey, it's already there, why do we care? Well, first of all, to be consistent, okay? So if we're not gonna do it in the new stuff, make sure the old stuff doesn't have it either, but also because it's making it shorter and it's still the same level of readability. Therefore, I think it's important to do. So, but notice I opened up new files and got new information messages. As we go through this, we'll probably find more of these. That's okay. That's just something you want to address as you go. Now, if you have 10,000 of these, and you say, man, it's just overwhelming. There's no way I can address them all. Address a few at a time. You can come down here to the error list and the left-hand corner, it says right now, entire solution. You can drop that down and say, open documents. And then as you're working on a, a file or a problem where you're kind of fixing something before you go, change to open documents and then look at the errors, warnings, and messages. Now, of course, errors you have to address no matter what, they won't compile otherwise. But warnings and messages, you don't. So be the good citizen, actually address those, clean a few up as you go, and over time, you'll make things better and better and better. Now, you'll get to the point where you get them all taken care of over time slowly. So that's my recommendation is to clean those out like we just did um, so that you have a, a clean slate to work from. You know that if something pops up here, you need to address it. Okay. So that's all we're going to do for right now. What I'm going to do is commit these changes, which is a lot of those changes. Normally you should do is review all these and make sure that you actually want all of these changes going in one commit. So now for us, I want all of these, but notice you can just double click on it and you can see the differences. So in this case, here's the new stuff that I added. In fact, I added a, quite a few lines down here. I want to get rid of those lines. So let's, um, let's open the file. Makes it a little better. So now we have all files review to make sure that all these files are what you want and then give it a good message. So let's address warning and info messages. Cleans up the system so there are no more warnings or informational messages. Um, that's good enough. I hit commit and then I can just push this because I know that there is nothing on the, uh, the server and that has actually popped up a message saying, Hey, you need to authenticate. I did that off screen. Um, this is actually a new PC. I actually had to wipe my PC entirely down to the bare metal and start over again because of some issues with windows, but we're up and running now. If you noticed before, um, I had issues with IIS. Uh, I don't anymore, and it's all good. But now those files are all pushed up to Azure DevOps and um, failed to push to remote. Well, they will be all up to Azure DevOps if they aren't already. I will um, check to make sure they actually are. Uh, I think they were pushed up, but we'll see. So that, that's all we have for this lesson. In the next lesson, we're actually get to actually doing the work. We've been kind of getting ready to do the work and ready to do the work and ready to do the work, but this was important to get cleaned up before we actually did the work. In the next lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a test connection basically to our API using authentication where we talk and say, Hey, I want the product list. We're going to ask for the product list and make sure that the, our authentication is set up properly using the token properly and that we can get back a 
a list of our products and do all the things we can do in WPF using the WPF library, but in our Blazor WebAssembly app. Okay, so that's coming up in the next lesson on the Timco Retail Manager. Thanks for watching. As always, I am Tim Corey.